さバガワトアラトサマサンブダサナモタサバガワトアラトサマサンブダサナモタサバガワトアラトサマサンブダサ Homage to him, the blessed one, blessed one, the worthy one, the fully enlightened one. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So tonight we're going to talk about、um, something very special. It's very, very important. and Frightfully scary to Westerners. I don't think it's as scary to Easterners, but it's frightfully、um, scary to Western psychologists sometimes because they don't spend enough time to experiment and to examine carefully what this is all about. So, hopefully, if I'm a little bit successful tonight. I'm going to be able to straighten out what, you, what your ideas are about this. And you'll come to understand why it is that Bhante Vimala Ramsey chose to、uh, change self and no self to an, a personal or an impersonal perspective. And you see, Part of this is about how we teach, we choose to teach you in a way, hopefully, where when we teach you something, you can go out and test it. And this is because the Buddha was teaching a specific method of teaching. He set up something different than the gurus in his day. He set things up so that you would have to gain knowledge through vision. Knowledge and vision in the texts became a pillar stone, sort of, it's actually a foundation stone for the development of knowledge and wisdom. His method of teaching. Was to、um, not to persuade you, not to convert you, not to proselytize to you. His method of teaching was to teach you something that when he was through telling you about it, you would go out the next day and attempt to see it for yourself. This is really important. This is what is so different about the way Buddha Gautama taught. So, I'm not going to go through everything here. I'm going to、um, just teach you myself first, and then we'll follow the sutta. But we're going to examine the teaching of the first, this characteristic, one of the three characteristics, which is an anatta, the anatta. And this anatta was given by the Buddha, famously given by the Buddha in a sermon given to the five ascetics. The second sermon that he taught after the turning of the wheel, and they're celebrating this this week. So we, I thought, since we were all talking about it, Other monastics and we're having discussions about it. It would be good for you to take a look at this. Now, the Anatta Lakana Sutta is found in a few places, but we are going to the Samyutta Nikaya 22.59. And this is discussing, trying, he was teaching. Now, let's keep this in mind. This Characteristic of non self has a kind of a twist in order to understand what the teaching really was. So you have to really try and follow this or take notes as we go along. The five ascetics, remember, the five ascetics had spent a lot of time with Siddhartha while he was the、uh, Gotama ascetic for a number of years. So 
the way I see this is that the five ascetics were rather tuned up to receive this through this particular sutta. However, for us today, there are certain parts of the Chichaka Sutta uh, in 148 that can be of a lot more help to us to see how to specifically work with this subject of anatta, the self, no self, okay, no self, or non-self, in a way that it will clear up how this teaching helps us and it helps all people to release a lot of suffering in life once it clicks into your brain, it has to click into your brain. Now, remember how I told you those specialists and research people say that neuroplasticity means your brain can change. That's wonderful news. <laughs> Nobody can say anymore, I am stuck and I can't ever change. It's not true with human beings. It takes a little bit of work because nobody is going to give you a little solution and say, just a minute, you know, here it is. It's in this box to change your life. Nope, it doesn't work that way. But our brain, this plasticity means it's flexible and it can change. If you learn to communicate with your mind and your brain, you can retrain your brain to let go of an old habit and start a new wholesome one to change your life. And this is what this is all about throughout all the training with the Buddha. Now in the what this, when I wrote to you, you need to pay attention because I, in this lesson, what I did for you was I spent time taking out the very famous ditto marks, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> you know, have been filled in for you so that you have a complete sutta to read through the, for this practice. And you can, you can take a look at what they listened to that made their minds start to go click as they repeated the sutta over and over and practiced what he mentioned. But when I take you to the Chachaka Sutta, then we're going to see how anybody can listen to that and recite it and read it for just take a week, read it in the morning, read it in the evening, the sections part that I gave you, by the end of the week, your brain's going to be saying, you know, there might be another way here where we can change uh, what's happening and not feel so much like things are happening to us once that we understand how this anatta works. So I uh, have filled in the ditto marks for you so you have a complete sutta to read through the practice. And also I found it an easier to more consistent understanding to make a few small word changes. And there's little notes in there in brackets that I put into brackets for you in the lesson. And if you've trained with me before, we're Bhante, you know that we take the goal of anatta training very seriously. And um, we give it to you in every retreat. There is the sixth day of the 10 day retreat, you have the anatta teaching and it leads to changing a person's perspective. So let's begin on this, not this non-self one. I'm gonna pull this up and I think I can read it on the board for you. Okay, you can follow me. Whoops, that's not it, let's see. There we go. Okay. And um, you can enlarge this. I was trying to save you paper. <laughs> I made it into 11 point, but you know, you can enlarge it by clicking on the little A in the home section of your Word document and make it get bigger for you. So this starts out, thus have I heard on one occasion, the blessed one was dwelling at Baranasi in the deer park at Isipatana. And there the blessed one addressed the monks, the group of five thus monks 
Venerable sir, those monks replied. And the blessed one said this, monks, form is non-self. For if monks form were self, this form would not lead to affliction and it would be possible to have this form to obey me when I think is what this is talking about. Let me form, my form be thus, let my form not be thus, but because form is non-self, form leads to affliction. It is not possible to have it of form, not possible for the form to change as I directed is what it means. Let my form be thus, let my form not be thus. You see people walking down the street, let me be different, let me be different. <laughs> Feeling is non-self. Now see, he's taking the five aggregates to do this example. Feeling is non-self. For if monks feeling were self, this feeling would not lead to affliction and it would be possible to have it of feeling for feeling to obey me when I think. Let my feeling be thus, let my feeling not be thus. But because feeling is non-self, feeling leads to affliction and it is not possible to have it of feeling not possible for the feeling to change as I direct it is what it means again. Let my feeling be thus, let my feeling not be thus. Perception is non-self. For if monks, perception were self, this perception would not lead to <clears throat> affliction and it would be possible to have it of per per perception for perception to obey me when I think. But let my perception be thus, let my perception not be thus. But because perception is non-self, perception leads to affliction. It is not possible to have it of perception, not possible for the perception to change as I direct it. Let my perception be thus, let my perception not be thus. So, you know, in the process of, well, we'll do this afterwards, I'll, I'll explain it to you. Volitional formations, thoughts are non-self. For if monks thoughts were self, this thoughts would not lead to affliction. And it would be possible to have it of thoughts for thoughts to obey me when I think, but let my thoughts be thus, let my um, thoughts, my, my uh, oops, perception often, let my thoughts not be thus, but because thoughts are non-self, thoughts lead to affliction and it is not possible to have it of thoughts, not possible for the thoughts to change as I would direct them to, cha it to change. So let my formations be the, whoops, we need, I, we, I missed there. Let my per, perception be thus. Let my perception not be thus. It's some, oh, we're on formations. I'm sorry, on formation. And then consciousness. Boy, this was tricky. Okay. Consciousness is non-self. For if monks' consciousness were self, this consciousness would not lead to affliction. And it would be possible to have it of consciousness or consciousness to obey me when I think. But let my consciousness be thus. Let my um, consciousness not be thus. For because consciousness is non-self, consciousness leads to affliction. And it is not possible to have it of consciousness not possible for the consciousness to change as I direct it once again. And let my consciousness be thus, let my consciousness not be thus. So just look at this section of her just a minute and take an example here quickly through it. But the form, the eye sees color and form, this is part of the 
process of the an anatomical body. So this is why when I give you the seven link chart and I tell you to work with the seven link chart, this is why this is green. Feeling is green. You know, the, the, where the eye has contact and, and with the form. These things are in the green zone. These are happening automatically the way we perceive form, right? And then feeling is the same way. Feeling is part of the function of the body. And then perception, you do not control your perception. If you see a red rose, you see a red rose and the process of perception is working. So perception is happening very quickly, okay? And then volitional formations are non-self, okay? Um, the formations are thoughts. This is why this got a little confusing for me because I'll explain briefly. Uh, volitional formations, volitional is like not exactly choice. I always say it's choice, you make a choice, but the formations arising is one thing. But when you say volitional formations, it sounds like I have a will to make a formation arise. And at the level in dependent origination, where you have ignorance formations in consciousness, this is a bit of a problem to say volitional because you're not volitional yet there. You're not, you're not volitional. There's stuff pushing from another, the karmic energy that comes through that's happening that pushes the formation. But if, and also if we were to change the word to say fabrication, we have a problem with fabrication because the question then happens that the student asks me exactly who fabricated what. And when you look at the dependent origination back that far to the beginning of ignorance formations consciousness, well, <laughs> No, <laughs> there's not a person there fabricating at that point. It's not, it doesn't make any sense. That's why we tell you the easiest way to, to settle your mind. So the, cat, the 12 parts, they all work together is to take formations as a pool of initial formations occurring that's flowing in from the energy of a past uh, past karmic thing, the karmic energy, but we're talking about what's happening in this lifetime when we give you the seven link chart. We're talking about six sense doors, okay, and then they can have contact, and then feeling can come up, then feeling coming up, craving can happen, and then clinging which is expanding your craving vastly with mental proliferation. proliferation. And then um, the bawa, we call the habitual tendency to react, how people react so fast in life. And then we talk about the birth of that reaction and then you have suffering, uh, sorrow, lamentation pain, grief, and despair. So we're talking about this lifetime, that part of the links that are functioning in this lifetime so that you can understand very clearly, okay, how that suffering is operating. Because if you don't know how it works, you cannot fix it. That is the secret here. So we cannot hide dependent origination in the closet, only talk about it in a way that is separate from helping us right now in this lifetime to reduce our suffering. That's why we use that seven link chart. If you need that, you need to let us know and we'll send you the copy of the seven link chart. Consciousness, of course, you cannot you cannot control, you can support your consciousness sticking around, for instance, if you're in an accident and um, you can actually have something to do with supporting it from falling out and coming back on and falling out and coming back on. I learned that as a lesson once when a, a tree fell on me, you know, and I learned how that works, but consciousness itself is not something personal that I control in my everyday life, you see. 
So this is what this part is about. The next part of the sutta, now we get a closer look at how the Buddha was training his monks by systematic questioning. Now, this is another piece of how he teaches. And we see for sure he was using the, um, the present type of research that's saying you can change if you systematically repeat to the brain the new direction until the brain gets it and goes in that direction. That's what I'm trying to show you here. So what, you, what, so what do you think, monks? Is form permanent or impermanent? Impermanent, sir. In, is what is impermanent suffering or happiness? Suffering, venerable sir. Is what is impermanent suffering and subject to change fit to be regarded thus? This is mine. This I am. This is myself. No, venerable sir. Is feeling permanent or impermanent? Impermanent, venerable sir. Is what is impermanent suffering or happiness? Suffering, venerable sir, is what is impermanent suffering and subject to change fit to be regarded thus. This is mine, this I am, this is myself. No, venerable sir, no. Is perception permanent or impermanent? Impermanent, venerable sir, is what is impermanent suffering or happiness. Suffering, venerable sir, is what is impermanent suffering and subject to change, fit to be regarded thus. This is mine, this I am, this is myself. No, venerable sir, are thoughts permanent or impermanent? Impermanent, venerable sir, is what is impermanent suffering or happiness? Suffering, venerable sir, is what is impermanent suffering and subject to change fit to be regarded thus? This is mine. This I am. This is myself. No, venerable sir. Is consciousness permanent or impermanent? Impermanent, venerable sir. Is what is impermanent suffering or happiness? Suffering, venerable sir. Is what is impermanent suffering and subject to change fit to be regarded thus? This is mine, this I am, this is myself. No, venerable sir. And then I call the next section the therefore section. This is how the suttas are so often set up. Then the Buddha says, therefore, monks, any kind of form whatsoever, whether it's about the past, the future, or the present, internal or external, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, all forms should be seen as it really is with correct wisdom. And we say the impersonal perspective is what he's showing you. Thus, this is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. Any kind of feeling whatsoever, whether past, future, or present, internal or external, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, all form should be seen as it really is with correct wisdom. Thus, this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. Next one, any kind of perception whatsoever, whether past, future, or present, internal, or external, 
gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, all forms should be seen as it really is, with correct wisdom thus, this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. Any kind of thought whatsoever, whether past, future, or present, internal or external, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, all forms should be seen as it really is with correct wisdom. Thus, this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. And last one, any kind of consciousness whatsoever, whether past, future, or present, internal or external, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, all form should be seen as it really is with correct wisdom. Thus, this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. Next part of it, next having heard this lesson, he sums up. Seeing thus, monks, the instructed noble disciple experiences revulsion. Now we say disenchantment, and I will tell you why. Revulsion is too harsh of a word to re uh, repel something, push it away. It's too harsh of a word in this point of your development. But disenchantment is a synonym for revulsion and makes a much gentler presentation that is not pushing you to personally try to push something away. Because seeing thus, you understand the instructed um, noble disciple experiences disenchantment from towards form, disenchantment towards feeling, disenchantment towards perception, disenchantment towards thoughts, disenchantment towards consciousness. Experienced in disenchantment, he or she becomes dispassionate. Through dispassion, his or her mind is liberated. And when it is liberated, there comes the knowledge. It is liberated. He understands, or she understands, destroyed his birth. The whole life has been lived. What had to be done has been done. There is no more to be done for any state of being. And being has a meaning for us a lot of times. No more, no, nothing more to be done for any state of being, no need for any reactions anymore. You can say it that way. No need for any reactions anymore because you have clearer understanding. The closing section, that is what the Blessed One said, elated, these monks delighted in the Blessed One's statement. And while this discourse was being spoken, the minds of those monks of the group of five were liberated from the taints of non-clinging. Now, there's a note I put here. Remember that this means that there was still craving to be dealt with before our hardship level. Remember that because this these five are sitting there looking at pressing Sotapanna in these two dis discourses. And this actually meant that the, the, uh, the monks upon hearing this came into Sotapanna level, okay? And then from there, they kept developing very fast to become the Arahats as he kept teaching them more. So now it's nice that the five aesthetics um, ascetics who had been the companions of the Buddha together for so many years of development could have taken over into the Sotapanna by hearing only this much of the subject of anatta. 
the Buddha knew this would be enough to take them the rest of the way to understanding anatta. But today, even if a student has the basic foundation information that we provide them you, uh, for you as you begin your training, you receive information about the Four Noble Truths, the five aggregates, the six sense doors, three kinds of feeling, and the seven link practice chart for applying dependent origination and the beginner exposure to the 37 requisites of awakening, they are not still not likely to get a clear understanding of anatta very quickly the way that happened. So my argument here is that you needed more you, it's not really an argument. It's just I'm saying my students need more than that in order to impress it inside them and start considering an alternative from atta behavior. You need more than that. So um, they must be uh, steady application, there must be steady application going on along with your sitting practice and your mindfulness observation all the time. A steady practice of a more impersonal perspective during all the time observation helps the most, in my opinion. Because why? Because you are following what they're saying you have to do to re purify and retrain mind. Certainly, this is true. So my suggestion is to fill in any gaps that are keeping one from having this anatta information digested more deeply in the brain is to also include uh, at least part of the Chichaka Sutta in 148 that we use to teach the anatta teaching, the six sets of six. And this sutta goes a little bit deeper in a little more organized way that was probably developed later on during the Buddhist teaching for yogis who were still asking a lot of questions about any idea of a self or non-self statement that it came up when it came up in the text when he was teaching the suttas. So there were all the people that came later um, I don't believe it was the um, Anatta Lakana Sutta that was helping those students unless they got very advanced into a deeper level and showed up and were ready to just fall like the five ascetics. And there could have been others that were ripe for that to happen, certainly. So the sections I have given you are the training sections where the Buddha knows there are monks who need to see more clearly what is meant by these terms. And the sutta was the first one that I ever memorized. Bhante had me memorize this one. I did in English. This was not in Pali because we were Americans. We had this little thing going, can an American learn Buddhism in their native tongue, English? the way a Thai can learn in Thai and Chinese and China, a uh, Chinese person learn in Chinese, et cetera, and so forth, Burmese and uh, et cetera, all across the board, why not? And then we, that's what we started to test with, he started to test with me and we're driving and driving and driving and all we're doing is memorizing, memorizing, memorizing. These three sections uh, answered the monks still questioning very clearly these sections I'm giving you. They also appear when you look at the formation of this part of the sutta, there's three pieces in the front of the sutta. The first part uh, is expounding on what the six sets are. And then after that, there begins these sections that happen. And the first question is why it cannot be true that the sense doors are self. Why are, Kara, is it true that they are not the self? He, he states it right out very, very clearly. Second part, 
how did we humans get to the point where we believed that was true anyway? That's a good question. How did we get to believing this misconception about the importance of the, the self when we're looking at the ultimate reality? And the third part, third question, how can you monks now purify your brain of the, that idea and set up another idea that is a complete change, leads to a complete change in your perspective? Okay, how? how? So essentially the way this sutta is set up, one gets a pretty clear message that we should memorize these parts anyway and memorizing this suit to, by the way, a friend of mine said, oh, I'm not going to try that one. It's way too long. But the thing about this suit is it has six parts and that's all. And then those six parts are repeated six times. And so you learn it very quickly and you can learn it section by section across the weeks you try to remember it or listen to it. And you can also listen to us reading it or reciting it online and do it with us. And it comes very quickly. So I've included these vital sections for you in this document where the drill is there very clearly to read through and try for yourself. I used it every day in all that I did while I was in the training back home. After I learned it, I had recited it in the forest while I was working. No matter what I was doing, if I ran into a problem, I went through the steps of why am I upset? What is going on? What is this that's happening with the craving? How is this working inside me? And ran through the parts of this text with the three sections. If I heard something, if I, um, if I smelled something, if I tasted something, if I touched something or thought something, I ran through that section. And that was just going all the time. And then your brain starts to grab a hold of it and you get it. Check out how the following sections of the Chachaka Sutra reveal the truths about an impersonal process that changes our perspective forever. So we go to the Chachaka Sutta and following the introduction and the enumeration of the six sets, we begin at section 10. Now I changed the titles of these sections just for you in training, the way I had them changed for me. The demonstration, the first section is the demonstration of why the idea of a self does not work. Can you wait just a second? I'm having a demand for water by the dog who just brought me his bowl and dropped it on my foot. The I is self, and thus the I is not self. If anyone says forms are self, that is not acceptable. The rise and fall of the forms are seen and understood. And since their rise and fall are discerned, it would follow myself rises and falls. But that is why it is not acceptable for anyone to say forms are self. Thus the I is not self, forms are not self. If anyone says to you, I consciousness is self, that is not acceptable. The rise and fall of I consciousness is seen and understood. And since its rise and fall are discerned, it would follow myself rises and falls. But that is why it is not acceptable for anyone to say, I consciousness is self. Thus the I is not self. Forms are not self. I consciousness is not self. If anyone says I contact is self, that is not acceptable. The rise and fall of I contact is seen and understood. And since its rise and fall are discerned, it would follow myself 
rises and falls. That is why it is not acceptable for anyone to say, I contact is self, and thus I is not self. Forms are not self. I consciousness is not self. I contact is not self. If anyone says, I feeling is self, that is not acceptable. The rise and fall of an I feeling is seen and understood. And since its rise and fall are discerned, it would follow myself rises and falls. That is why it is not acceptable for anyone to say I feeling is self. Thus, the I is not self. Forms are not self. I consciousness is not self. I contact is not self. I feeling is not self. If anyone says I craving is self, that is not acceptable. The rise and fall of I craving is seen and understood. And since its rise and fall are discerned, it would follow myself rises and falls. But that is why it is not acceptable for anyone to say I craving is self. Thus, I craving is not self. The I is not self. Forms are not self. I consciousness is not self. I contact is not self. I feeling is not self. I craving is not self. Now, I'm not going to go through another section, but you keep reading and then you do this for the ear, you see? And then you do it for the nose. And then. You keep going, do it for the tongue. It's all the same. And then you do it for the body. And last, you do it for the mind. If We'll do the mind. If anyone says mind is self, that is not acceptable. The rise and fall of the mind is seen and understood. And it means the rise and fall of thought. And since its rise and fall are discerned, it would follow myself rises and falls. That is why it is not acceptable for anyone to say mind is self. Thus, the mind is not self. If anyone says mind objects are self, that is not acceptable. The rise and fall of mind objects are seen and understood. And since their rise and fall are discerned, it would follow myself rises and falls. That is why it is not acceptable for anyone to say mind objects are self. Thus mind is not self, mind objects are not self. If anyone says mind consciousness is self, that is not acceptable. The rise and fall of mind consciousness is seen and understood. And since its rise and fall are discerned, it would follow myself rises and falls. That is why it is not acceptable for anyone to say mind consciousness is self. Thus mind is not self, mind objects are not self, mind consciousness is not self. If anyone says mind contact is self, that is not acceptable. The rise and fall of mind contact is seen and understood. And since its rise and fall are discerned, it would follow my self rises and falls. That is why it is not acceptable for anyone to say mind contact is self. Thus mind is not self, mind objects are not self, mind consciousness is not self, mind contact is not self. If anyone says mind feeling is self, that is not acceptable. If the rise and fall of mind feeling is seen and understood, and since its rise and fall are discerned, it would follow myself rises and falls. That is why it is not acceptable for anyone to say mind feeling is self. Thus, mind is not self. Mind objects are not self. Mind consciousness is not self. Mind contact is not self. Mind feeling is not self. If anyone says mind craving is self, that is not acceptable. The rise and fall of mind craving is seen and understood. And since its rise and fall are discerned, it would follow myself rises and falls.
That is why it is not acceptable for anyone to say mind craving is self. Thus, mind is not self. Mind objects are not self. Mind consciousness is not self. Mind contact is not self. Mind feeling is not self. Mind craving is not self. So here he's showing you uh, that that's the actual fact. <laughs> He's showing you this is what's real. But the monks are there with a question in their mind in front of him. How did the origination of this identity assumption come to be? How did we get stuck with this? Listen, now students, this is the way leading to the origination of identity. One regards the I thus, this is mine, this I am, this is myself. One regards forms thus, this is mine, this I am, this is myself. One regards I consciousness thus, this is mine, this I am, this is myself. One regards I contact thus, this is mine, this I am, this is myself. One regards I feeling thus, this is mine, this I am, this is myself. And one regards I craving thus, this is mine, this I am, this is myself. And he does this with each of the sense doors declaring this is mine, this I am, this is myself. And as you go through this, you just reflect for a minute. How did you learn this assumption of identity? You simply repeated it, didn't you? Learning it as you grew up, you can watch children discover it and fall into it and start embracing it. It is me, it is mine, it is myself. It is who I am even, that comes to that point. But then at the end of this, they're saying to themselves, how can we adopt a cessation of identity and realize the benefit of an impersonal perspective? That's what they're wondering. It's going to change how we look at things. And you know, this sutta, I have to say, it's almost like a playbook for the neurological research that was done that uncovered the neuroplasticity in how you train to change something. It's like a playbook. This is exactly what the Buddha was doing and how he was retraining his students to accept a different perspective. So in this part, he says, now students, this is the way that's leading to the cessation of identity. One regards the I thus, this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. One regards forms thus, this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. One regards I consciousness thus, this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. One regards eye contact, thus, this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. One regards eye feeling, thus, this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. One regards eye craving, thus, this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself, okay? So this isn't something that you see, you're doing this. You say, how can I do that? How can I do that? Look at the ramifications of the importance or the importance of the ramifications. What happens when you shift to this position? I didn't mean what I'm saying. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. You see, that opens up the door because it wasn't me. It wasn't mine. It wasn't myself. I can say, I'm sorry. Forgive me. I was upset. I'm sorry, let it go into the past, let it go, let me stay in the present, let me do things one at a time in the presence here as I'm living, you see? There's all kinds of things, questions you ask regarding how, how can we do this? The question is why not try to do it? Look at the world, everybody, 
is taking it totally, totally personally. That's how all this stuff gets messed up everywhere. So, I mean, why not embrace what you really want to have happen in the future? Because I'll tell you a secret. The things that you want to have happen in the future, loving kindness, compassion, joy, equanimity, the use of forgiveness, compassion, applying, not talking about or debating about or reading or writing about, applying loving kindness in return, patience, listening, all those things, they're inside you already waiting for you to attempt to jump the system. <laughs> and forgive someone, why not? They'll be totally shocked. They might even buy you ice cream. <laughs> I mean, I'm being silly, but why not? Why stay angry? I could tell you a story at the end of this, I think. Something I did that was really crazy one time when I was growing up. Uh, anyway, in this situation, He's saying this is true of the eye and the ear and the nose and the tongue. And this is what we practiced all the time. And if we were caught stuck in something, Bonte would remind us, or one of us would remind each other in the first five or six of us that were there, you see, that would remind each other. We would remind each other. And that's how it worked with the ascetics that were with the Buddha reminding each other, sharing where they were, gaining confidence together and supporting each other all the time. So when you get to thoughts that come into your mind, and this is a big one when you're looking at depression. If you take a depression and you say, it's mine, you're in trouble. If you look at it a different way and say, this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. How can we do that, Sister Kama? Because of a little friend we talked about before. Anicca, whatever arises, passes away. Why are we biting into it, paying attention to it, feeding it, making it bigger? That's where the control comes for us to have enough knowledge how things work to take the steps we need to never mind, recognize and never mind, let go, relax, smile, come back. That's how we change. Training your mind. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. I don't own it. I don't take it. I don't believe it's going to always be this way. Because why? Because nothing is always going to be anyway. Is it? You look at the terms of minutes, hours, days, weeks, years, centuries. Is it? I don't think so. Well, I can't seem to leave you like this. This is what bugged me about when I finished doing this. And you can see I didn't go back and use the spell check as much as I should, should have. Okay. But well, I came to, can't seem to leave you like this at this point where I was going to cut you off. And without seeing one sense door section that cannot lead to Nibbana and an example of what happens for that sense door when the perspective shifts and becomes impersonal and you can reach path and you can go down and it is real and it is possible to wake up level by level by level. So look at the next section in the sutta, the structural section comes at 28, verse 28. And the actual thing is saying the underlying tendencies that are showing you how the suffering happens. And when you keep that personal perspective, you hang on to it. Reaching Nibbana is impossible. You can meditate for relaxation, but you're not going to go and experience Nibbana. If you take it personally, if you take it as a personal goal and you long and long and long and have to have it, that's personal approach. If you sit and just let go of everything to see what happens next and accept that 
that whole process is a natural law that can come to be and occur as an experience. If the conditions are right, it will, it will happen. Students, dependent on the I and forms, I consciousness arises. The meeting of the three is eye contact with eye contact as condition, there arises an eye feeling felt as pleasant or painful or neither pleasant nor painful. When one is touched by a pleasant eye feeling, if one delights in it, welcomes it and remains holding to it, then the underlying tendency to lust lies within one. When one is touched by a painful eye feeling, if one sorrows, grieves, and laments, weeps beating one's breast and becomes distraught, then the underlying tendency to aversion lies within one. When one is touched by a neither pleasant nor painful eye feeling, if one does not understand as it actually is, the origination, the disappearance, the gratification, the danger, and the escape in regard to that I feeling, then the underlying tendency to ignorance lies within one. Students, that one shall here and now make an end of suffering without abandoning the underlying tendency to lust for pleasant I feeling without abolishing the underlying tendency to aversion towards painful eye feeling, without extirpating the underlying tendency to ignorance in regard to neither pleasant nor painful eye feeling, without abandoning ignorance and arousing true knowledge, this is impossible. You repeat this section for the other five sense doors when you're training. For the ears, the nose, the tongue, the body, and the mind experiences. And this is versus the abandonment of the underlying tendencies, which he is trying to make us understand. How suffering doesn't happen and Nibbana can occur when you have an impersonal perspective. Listen to the difference. Students, dependent on the I and forms, I consciousness arises. The meeting of the three is I contact. With I contact as condition, there arises an I feeling felt as pleasant or painful or neither pleasant nor painful. When one is touched by a pleasant eye feeling, if one does not delight in it, welcome it and remain holding to it, then the underlying tendency to lust does not lie within one. When one is touched by a painful eye feeling, if one does not sorrow, grieve and lament, does not weep, beating one's breast and become distraught, then the underlying tendency to aversion does not lie within one. When one is touched by a neither pleasant nor painful eye feeling, if one understands as it actually is, the origination, the disappearance, the gratification, the danger, and the escape in regard to that I feeling, then the underlying tendency to ignorance does not lie within one. Students, that one shall here and now make an end of suffering by abandoning the underlying tendency to lust for pleasant I feeling by abolishing the underlying tendency to aversion towards painful eye feeling, by extirpating the underlying tendency to ignorance in regards to neither pleasant nor painful eye feeling, 
by abandoning ignorance and arousing true knowledge, this is possible. You repeat the section for the ears, the nose, the tongue, the body, and the mind. When you switch your perspective and choose to abandon absolutely everything, just become the watcher, the witness of what can happen if you let go. Nibbana is possible. The sutta then goes into the liberation. The liberation of mind begins happening as you continue to practice this. You are training the mind. Let go, let go, let go. Never mind, never mind, never mind. Let go, relax and smile and come back. Let go, relax and smile and come back. That's what you're doing. Seeing thus, students, a well-taught noble disciple becomes what? Disenchanted with the eye, disenchanted with forms, disenchanted with eye consciousness, disenchanted with eye contact, disenchanted with eye feeling, disenchanted with eye craving. What's it mean? It means you will not fall into craving. I don't like it. I don't want it. I want to make it stop. It won't go there. You, you're sensitive to this tension and tightness. You're going to let go. Let go. Let go. Let go. He becomes disenchanted with the ear, disenchanted with sounds, disenchanted with ear consciousness, disenchanted with ear contact, disenchanted with ear feeling, disenchanted with ear craving. Doesn't mean you stop hearing, just means you stop reacting. You begin listening to precisely what is essentially listening to. You make a decision how to respond and how to act. You don't react. You see, he becomes disenchanted with the nose, disenchanted with odors, disenchanted with nose consciousness, disenchanted with nose contact, disenchanted with nose feeling, disenchanted with nose craving. He becomes disenchanted with the tongue, disenchanted with flavors, disenchanted with tongue consciousness, disenchanted with tongue contact, disenchanted with tongue feeling, disenchanted with tongue craving. Okay. But still, when you go visit your mother, be sure you tell her it was a good meal she cooked. Tell her and be kind and gracious and compassionate. Doesn't mean you don't taste it just means you don't get hooked beyond the moment. He becomes disenchanted with the body, disenchanted with tangibles, disenchanted with body consciousness, disenchanted with body contact, disenchanted with body feeling, disenchanted with body craving. Doesn't mean you can't go to the gym and work out and develop your muscles and be a healthy person. Just don't spend half an hour in front of the mirror, okay? Do your workout and go on with your daily life. He becomes disenchanted with mind, disenchanted with mind objects, disenchanted with mind consciousness, disenchanted with mind contact, disenchanted with mind feeling, disenchanted with mind craving. You don't get stuck, you keep moving. Being disenchanted, he eventually becomes dispassionate. And through dispassion, mind is liberated. When it is liberated, there comes the knowledge. It is liberated. He understands birth is destroyed. The holy life has been lived. The struggle of trying to figure all this out is over. You've got a clear enough knowledge. You've come to a strong enough balance and a large enough equanimity and emptiness that this can happen. What had to be done has been done in training. There is no more coming to any state of being. Now, if we use our 
state of being and you're talking about the seven link chart. There is no more coming to any state of reacting. You see? You're going to be the person who will live by responding intelligently after considering wholly what is happening. That is what the Blessed One said. And the students were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. And while the discourse was being spoken, through not clinging the minds of 60 students, and this is the story, 60, 60 monks were liberated from the taints when he first gave this talk. So from the standpoint of a neurologist, this experience abandons every single point of stress that has been stored up in the brain, caught without a way to get out. And so the way I reason this, that exaltation felt, that surge of what could be described as newborn curiosity extremely strong life energy, and this is coming from a student that was in Florida, extremely strong life energy comes up and no barriers to discovery of everything, everywhere, is much like watching a newborn baby grow up along the way, discovering things for the first time one by one. Without our adult years, Everyone should have the opportunity to, um, within our adult years, we should have the opportunity to stop long enough to experience the immense relief, this lifting off of all weight of cares off the mind and remarkable clarity of senses through mind, heart, brain. There is a complete change in physical existence while this lasts. And it's like having a second chance, beginning choice again, once again. It's like whether to live in the present time as you move along now because you understand it and make an effort to stay there instead of being invaded or allow it to slip away, unexercised and cared for as you continue on. This is what I tell my students a couple years ago, maybe three years back, I decided, you know, Bonte likes to say that you're making, he's putting a crack in your cosmic egg, but you have to hatch the egg. As a mom, I like to say, we just helped you give birth to a baby. So now you take it with you when you leave and you have to take care of it. You've had the opportunity to see that that can happen to the brain and you can cleanse and empty and have this clear state. It's up to you. What are you going to do with that if you can reach the condition of letting go, abandoning, relinquishing, releasing, allowing, let it be. Never mind it and see for yourself what will happen if you experience this experience of no experience. Where will it go when the brain is free of us in this day and time? That's the question. So what will you do with it? What will you do with it? If you manage to pull it off and experience that, you go home and just go back to normal and ignore that you can set up these boundaries of the past and future and stay here as you move along. And you can build on it and keep practicing. Or are you just going to just let go of it and fall back and say, wow, Retreat is over. Now I can go home and get back to life. <laughs> you know, and one guy from Washington, D.C. said to me, well, I have to go home now. <laughs> I said, what's wrong? Everybody's happy. I know, but I have to go home now. I said, what does that mean? I have to go back to the belly, into the belly of the beast. Oh, I lived there for a while and I know what he's saying but you don't, this is entirely up to you. 
up to you. Questions? It was a very nice teaching on uh, Anatta today. So I have a question about this uh, uh, difference between uh, disenchantment and uh, indifference. You know, it, it seems like uh, how the Sutta describes that you don't delight in uh, uh, pleasant feelings, which means you're uh, being indifferent to uh, pleasant feelings. Or, uh, is that what disenchantment means? Tell me, tell me the two pieces again, disenchantment and what? Dissatisfaction or what? Indifference. Indifference, okay. The best way for you to remember very quickly what this is, the difference between equanimity, the disenchantment is a very high level of equanimity. Do you remember the chart that I showed you with the circle, the circle piece like this? And I said, in fact, in truth, when we're developing equanimity, they, you walk into the temple from Washington DC and you sit on the floor and they say, sit down, be still, don't speak, and just close your eyes and learn to meditate. And this is the first time anybody ever said that to me in Washington DC when I was going through a really hard time personally, but I was going through a very heavy job load at the same time. You know, and I thought this was like God's creation of equanimity. That was just the end. That was just going in the door, and then you became you became calm and you meditated. You had joy come up. You had tranquility. You had stupor come up. Happiness. All of this is getting better and better. You went back and sat down again, and then you went further and further. And on that chart, it's showing you you went from the first time of sitting from Pomoja, which we call it relief. That's what it was. Because when I went home that night, I slept like a baby and I hadn't slept in almost three years. And I mean, I slept like a baby, okay? You hit Pomoja, then PT. You see, and all these pieces are taking you down the stairs to the last step of the staircase, the way Mogolana was told into the deepest part. So if we look at that chart, and this Upanisha Sutta is what you need to, if you if you go in uh, 553, five page 553, the proximate cause in the Samyutta Nikaya. If you have those papers still, you go back and you look at that list, because I think I gave you that list, okay? So let me see if we could do it. You start sitting, you're, you're miserable. You come in, the monk says, ah, sit down. <laughs> And you sit down, he says, don't move. That's hard enough that you can't move after you've been twisting and turning all day at the office and fussing with everybody at the hospital all day long. In, in, internally, if you didn't show it outside, it was going on inside, come on, okay? And then you, you experience this relief. And then what happens is joy comes up, this is PT, and PT fades away, the uplifted joy, and you get a, a bonus, tranquility. And the tranquility is a stillness like you never felt before. I used to go to the hospital sometimes with people and tell them about this little track, the story, and they'd say, I don't know anything you mean, tranquility. I said, I know, it's really, 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 really calm. You never experienced it in, in life itself before. And when the tranquility fades away too, because of Anicca, what's left is sukha. And sukha is happiness. And everybody thinks of happiness. We just went to the fair. Oh boy. <laughs> no, 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 no. Buddhist happiness is internal contentment is the best way to say this internal contentment so now you have this internal contentment that and you think this is good stuff i'm going to come back tomorrow night and sit again <laughs> and i had a house not uh, two blocks away and i came back and i sat again and kept going so now when you sit and you keep going you realize you can get this balance of productive level of concentration, which he calls collectedness of mind, gentle collectedness of mind. And all of this, if you look at the chart, is, is developing this equanimity more and more, okay? And then as you get this um, collectedness of mind, you sit again, and as he's teaching you the comprehension of the Dhamma along with this, you therefore reach what happens next on the chart. And it's called the, um, 
the um, right knowledge and vision of how things actually work. And that's actually an attainment level on the chart. Knowledge and vision of how things actually work, where you're discovering how the dependent origination is working because you were taught the comprehension of the foundation information properly. And so you continue. And now when you continue, you're getting into the deeper states and the longer sitting. By now, you're getting into the longer sitting. You've gone through metta developed into karuna very softly and moved up into your head, developed into all the empathetic joy where you felt other people's happiness easily as well as even more so than your own. And that turned into, turns into at the deeper states, uh, that one turns into this equanimity that is the stronger type with the seven factors of enlightenment. So now we got this other set of pieces we learned about starting to weave into this whole thing. If you throw up in front of you the those seven factors, you've been using mindfulness, you've been doing the investigation, you have balanced your energy, you have discovered joy, it faded away and you experienced tranquility and you reached a balance of uh, the um, level of your concentration, and then this equanimity that is hitting now is that last one. And that equanimity is strong, which turns into disenchantment. But all the while, you have awareness in your mind. You have awareness, and you are aware of what is going on. You have a clarity that you don't have with other meditations because they didn't give you this, 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 two lines of comprehension and the training of the meditation. They sat you down and they said, every time you ask a question, go and sit and pretty soon you'll get it. You'll understand. But how can you, if you are not hearing what he taught, it's I cannot find the person who can tell me they got it just by sitting. Sure, they calmed down, but the big question to ask them is how did they handle the hindrances and how long did it take them? Because that's one of the teachings, isn't it? And one of the te by learning that hint, the secret of the hindrances is what? Look, I'm going to tell you, you're a doctor, but I'm going to tell you there's a truck out in the parking lot at the hospital and it's broken and you need to go out and fix it. Can you handle a 21 wheel long haul truck engine and fix it because nobody's there? And you go, I don't know what's under the hood. <laughs> I, what do I know about this energy in this truck that makes it go, how can I fix an engine? Buddha didn't do that to them. The Buddha told them every single inch of the way, every single piece and cog that was in the thing and how it went together. That's what's exciting to me. He didn't leave anything out. He didn't say when the person died, okay, I'm not being, I'm not being rude here, but when six or people in my family died in 10 months and I go to them, to my to my church and ask him what what do i do with this and he says ah you know dust we come from dust we go to dust to dust you'll get over it i didn't get over it <laughs> i really crashed i did not get over it i fell into a dysfunctional hole and fell into a depression thinking dust to dust and it didn't work i'm sorry and nobody came to save me and I was so dysfunctional, I finally drove to the, to the doctors and said, look, I know you're next to the hospital, so I'm parking the car, can you let me in? <laughs> That's how I went. That's what happened. Nobody had to come scrape me off the floor. I just said, That's it, somebody in there, maybe they know. Well, they did a good job. I'm going to tell you, they did a really good job. But that's before they start. They started saying you can only stay four days. I had good insurance. They let me stay for 28 days. And after that, they gave me, no, they let me stay for 18 days. And they gave me 10 days as an outpatient coming in every day before I could go back into life. I was broken, totally broken. The first, this is the first year I have talked about this openly to people like this. I never talk about this, but that's a fact. I broke. Why did I break? Because they told me to go fix the truck and then nobody told me what was under the hood. 
and it was blocking the people coming into your hospital and nobody was taking care of it. You desperately wanted to fix it, but you didn't know what to do. You lift the hood, you, what's in here? What's happening? So this, this is all about equanimity and he's telling you, and that was the most wonderful thing to have somebody identify how to be calm and I'll just move out of the way and see what this is about. I was always curious about the brain. I was always wanting to know what the capacity of this thing is in our skull. And because of that, I just wanted to watch. I was willing to watch finally. And what happens is what, you, what you're going towards, disenchantment is starting to take hold where you're just saying, look, I have told this brain, never mind, let it go, relax, smile, come back, things will change. That's a, ma that's a magic thing. That's a magic thing. You know, you, you handle people here. I bet you had some people come into your hospital from that terrible flood that came in the, one part of the area not far away from here where it washed down the streets and took everything apart. How do you think those people feel? Everything is gone. And for a while, a lot of them, they can't speak. They can't speak. They had everything washed away. What do you do with that? You teach them that they are powerful and they can learn how to, to develop these levels of equanimity can naturally develop in the person. So when you're talking disenchantment or you're talking mindfulness and indifference, the difference between disenchantment, mindfulness is still there. You experience disenchantment. You experience being disenchanted when the gun goes off or this happens or that happens. And you look, all of a sudden you don't go, oh, like that. You go, oh, a gun. Okay, let's, I wonder what that is. And you investigate. You don't go crazy anymore. But in your earlier life, you went crazy. You see? When you're driving down the road and a, by a, a motorcycle, I love this guy. I had a taxi driver. He was brilliant in, in Sri Lanka. He was taking me downtown in Colombo and a, a motorcycle came along. I don't know what he was doing. I can't say he was on the phone and on the bike. That would drive me crazy. <laughs> but he was on that bike and I saw him out the corner of my eye. He went right into a panel truck in the back and went down and we thought he was dead. And stopped the cab. He says, I got to get out for a second. I knew right away what he was doing. And I said, fine, you go take care of it. He walked across the street and got the guy's bike up, got the guy off the street, got two guys to come over and hold him until somebody came. And the car was parked just off the, off the curb, up on the curb on the other side. I just sat there. He came back. I wanted to just hug him. I said, you know, I really needed that today to see that the average person is going to do that because I did that growing up at, at least nine, about nine, I think nine times total with car accidents along the way in my life. You see, you stop. How could I do that? How? Didn't disturb me. I, I did it once in California. Got, I said, Bonte, sit here. I got to do something. He knew what was going on. I got out of the car, went to the other lane and helped a person out of the car that was in a car that was catching fire and put him down on the green and made another person call the police who was there like this. <gasps> and I'm there, stop doing that. Get your phone and call the, you know, call the ambulance. I called the ambulance. And then I said, now when they come, here's what you tell them. Here's the guy's pulse and I wrapped something around his head and the bleeding is stopping and I have to go and he left. And that's just, that's the Samaritan thing. And how could I do that? It didn't disturb me. I got back in the car and he said, okay. I said, okay, we just drove away. There's no discussion. And there's no upheaval. It's just, that's what you need. That's how you do things. Doctors, you know, you learn to compartmentalize. You people learn to compartmentalize and you have to do things one at a time. How would it be if you had somebody in the emergency room and you had a lot of lacerations coming in that needed to be sutured and somebody was there who was, I can't stand, what am I gonna do? What are we gonna do next? Look at all this problem. No, you have triage. Now you look at triage for your mind. Back up if you're confused about this, but the truth is that when your, your mindfulness is sharp, then you have full mindfulness operating 
when you are in disenchantment or you are in equanimity, this is a level of equanimity. So if we keep going on that chart, we had collectedness of mind, we had disenchantment. And then after a period of time of disenchantment, you fell into a spot that was dispassion and then you got empty and then you fell into cessation is what happened to you. If you went through one time, that is what happened to you. Now, this business of getting into the right condition to be empty enough to fall over into cessation. Okay. If you don't have the parallel training with that, you're going to say, oh, there was a blackout. That's all. It just a blackout. That's all that happened. No, I'm going to come back now. I'm okay. You don't know anything about what happened to you, but if you have more information about what was into the under the hood in the engine for the truck, you might be able to flip the carburetor and <laughs> t- tighten a couple of screws and start the truck again. You see? Now the problem we have is uh, our teachers helping a person to learn loving kindness and compassion and joy and equanimity along with the foundation teaching, or are they just teaching them how to do the the four levels and make them work? Oh, good, that's a good start, but it's not the real tamale, is it? (laughs) It's not. So they need to go back and look really hard and fast at the eight pieces we're trying to show you. The foundation pieces and then instructions and then the uh, hindrance story, the story of the hindrances, how they actually work so that you don't have to get exhausted with them. When you talk about indifference, there's no mindfulness. Indifference has no mindfulness. That's the key to this. Indifference is indifference. Uh, corollary, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. So a uh, corollary to my question is on uh, page 14, that is section 34. Mm-hmm. which you uh, just described that is about the abandonment of underlying tendencies mm-hmm. section 34 of the sutta. yeah there uh, we say when one is touched by a pleasant eye feeling one does not delight in it right so if you are seeing a nice lovely sunset you don't delight in it Okay, why? Wait, why does it say that? What does this delight mean? Certainly when I see, I can show you a picture I took of a sunset in India and boy, I delighted in it. Yeah, but then it was in the present time and it was gone, (laughs) okay? But what this is talking about in the sutta is if you delight in it, I really like it. I really want it, attachment, and I'm going to keep thinking about it, and I'm not going to function. By the time I get home, I'm going to have the whole thing straight, ready to tell Corel. <laughs> okay, so the rest of the time, you didn't see that little boy smile in the village when you went by in the cart, you know, if you were in the in the, in the the hay cart. You didn't see that. You didn't see the lovely thing where the couple was there. You didn't see a lot of things. I see everything, but I don't hold on to it. Sometimes I tell the dog about it, but <laughs> you know, but I joke. But, but I mean, you know, the thing is about this is about holding on, isn't it? Isn't it? So you say when touched by a pleasant by feeling, if one does not delight in it, welcome it and remain holding to it. That's the phrase. It didn't say delight in it, don't delight in it. It didn't say, okay, Barat's an arahat. Now he can't smell the rose anymore. Listen, I was thinking the other day about this. I went back into the instructions for the breathing meditation and I noticed something. In, in 118, I noticed the instructions about what these people are doing each day. I think it was, in, I'm pretty sure it was. Let me, let me just look for a second. Uh, if you go to 118 and you go to section 18 to find uh, the, um, find the, um, uh, wait a minute, you go to 118 and then you go to the instructions in section 18 and um, it says, um, yeah, well, where is it? Here you go, wait a minute. Oh, come on, it's the part about the heap of straw. 
I can't find it. Monty, I can't find it. I don't know where it is. But it's the thing about when they go out every morning, you know, after they after they go on alms round, they come back and they live like I told you how they live together in 128. I told you that section 14, right? Like milk and water, blending like milk and water, and they're all happy, okay. And then they clean up the refectory and they clean up everything. And when they're finished, what do they do for the day? They went out and they found a field or a cliff or they found a tree or they found a rock to sit on or they or they sat under a tree. But sitting under the tree, there's nothing about sitting under the tree that's so big here. When you look through the suttas, uh, they went to a heap of straw. Well, obviously, if they went to a heap of straw, they got up on top of it or they, they made a hole in it so they could be in the shade with the sun on the other side and they sat in it. But it also talks about there's four positions here. They can walk in meditation. They can sit in meditation. They can lie down on the heap of straw and they can meditate. You got that? They can lie down on it or they can uh, sit. Let's see, sit and walk and lie down. I can't remember the fourth one. Isn't there four of them, Bonte? Four? Yeah? Um, he's, that yeah, is, I, uh, you can uh, do it uh, standing. There uh, it sit. is. Standing, sitting, walking. walking, or lying down. There you go. Four positions to do your meditation in. Now, the only reason we frustrate you from lying down when you come to a retreat, if you tell me you have a heart condition or you just had an operation, I'm going to set you up to lie down. But I have decided I'm not going to let you do it in your room anymore <laughs> because I, I don't believe people go in their room and lie down and actually do this when they're just learning this. I'm sorry. They go in their room and they lie down, have a nap, and they don't even mean to. They just kind of fall asleep. OK, until you you get what you're looking at and everything. The point is, you can do it in any position that you're in. OK. And when you are meditating. Um, there's no instructions and there's nothing in this sutta that says do not delight in anything ever again. And then they're walking back to have lunch. And when they're coming back, guess what they see? They see these small um, orchids that grow in the forest. There's small orchids that grow in the shadows of the forest or the jungle. And they see a really beautiful one. When they come back, they tell people what they saw. And next time you walk down that path, you ought to see it because it bloomed. Every, and then, then they go down there, they'll see it, they'll smell it. And then it's done, it's gone. See? This illusion, uh, it's a really, it's, a, it's like you, you made a wrong turn. Sometimes the student makes a wrong turn thinking, I can't smile anymore. I'm Buddhist. Okay. No more smile. Okay. Another one is I can't smell the flowers anymore. Of course you can. As long as you do it in the present time and you don't hold on to it and get dysfunctional and start clinging in your meditation thoughts come up about this that happened at the flower show and that, you know, you have to, Never mind, teach the mind. That's why I say to you guys, you are training yourself to communicate with your mind for the first time in your life. I think there are people who have learned to do this. I'm not sure about medical school and surgeons. I'm not sure. Okay, but I, I will venture to say that in the military, this is definitely part of your basic training. I know it is in the Army and in the Air Force, and I'm sure it is in the Marines, because I have seen what they do when they come to the, um, how they rest when they're put on um, uh, the four color guards. You know, the four color guards are sent out to do a bunch of funerals for a lot of different funerals. These guys just sit down and take five minutes and come out. They're totally trained in determinations with their mind. And they are totally taught how to take rest in a state of crisis and then come back to work so that they can work longer. This is the kind of thing your nurses and doctors were getting from Bonte and me when in Florida in showing them how to do power sits. Power sits have no secret. It's just about communicating with your mind and trusting that it is possible to, in the short span of a disaster, to train yourself to be able to go, go aside. 
utility rooms in the hospitals, <laughs> utility room, and sit on one of the uh, big buckets for even five or 10 minutes and get an hour to two hours value in sleep when they measured it. That's what they said was happening. See? And then you can come back. But if you go into the break room where they're either, well, they're probably not smoking anymore, maybe, but radio and writing and talking and chatting and everything, it's not going to cut it. It's just a break from walking around. But if you can go somewhere where you're quiet, and uh, I, I envy the Muslims because they have these prayer rooms all over Malaysia, but I'm not allowed to go in. <laughs> <laughs> but I envy that because when I have to go take care of stuff at a big mall or something, I have nowhere to go. I don't know where to go to be absolutely quiet other than go to the movie and put the earphones <laughs> in that and be quiet for a little while. Or if I'm stuck and I can't get a ride to go somewhere, you know, I've had that happen. So coming back to this, learning about the development of this this um, equanimity, it has all these little words that apply to it. And also when you see a word like that, like delight, it's a good example of what happened here because you took delight and asked me a question, uh, but you didn't take the nature of the delight in the sentence when you did that. Because it does not, uh, if one does not delight in it, welcome it and remain holding to it, then what? And the underlying tendency to lust does not lie within one, then you're not going to hold on to it, have a desire to hold on to it. You're going to be able to continue thinking or doing whatever you're doing without being pulled off. See, that's all that means. Okay. Well, that was a long way around, wasn't it? <laughs> no, no, that's that's fine. That's, uh, thank any you. Other, thank any you. other question? Any other questions? Yeah. Hello, you? Are you there? Hi. Oh, hi. Thank you very much, sister. A very, uh, very interesting talk. Um, I have, um, uh, I've got a couple of questions, but we may not have time for all of them. Uh, um, the equanimity um, that you described as um, uh, coming through in uh, fourth jhana, and the equanimity that's described as the step before disenchantment. Um, what's the difference between those? Because obviously the equanimity of fourth jhana develops earlier in the practice compared to the equanimity later. Okay, first of all, let's not get confused about fourth jhana because the this is this is the confusion that happens sometimes. You know, because we're living, we live, uh, we kind of laugh about this because we're living in an eight jhana, um, an eight jhana. Wait a minute. We're living in an eight jhana place and, and the monks are talking about a four jhana place. So what was that about? So actually the development chart, it goes like this. And you have um, one, two, three, four, and we see it as five, six, seven, and eight as infinite space, infinite consciousness, nothingness, and neither perception or non-perception. And now I'm gonna mess up here, but okay, there. <laughs> that was really fun. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I got to go back here, sister. Okay. This is what we're dealing, we're living with now, but when they were living in the time of the Buddha and they were writing the text, they were living like this. And then Okay, one, two, three, four, and then it went like this. So it was one, two, three, four. And then the subcomponents of the fourth jhana were infinite space, infinite consciousness, neither no, nothingness and the funny show off guy, neither perception nor non perception. And then you fell into cessation. They didn't even talk about cessation as a state. They talked about it as a destination, but not a state. Okay. Uh, but, but, um, so when we're talking about equanimity, 
this is we're really talking about they say equanimity came in the fourth jhana if you see that stated that means it arrived it arrived in a definitive way it arrived so it's very likely that when the components of the first three jhanas have not fallen away to go into the fourth jhana yet you know how there's certain parts come and certain parts go away in the chart okay well, if those these pieces have not fallen away, the person doesn't get to experience the equanimity until that happens, and it shows up in the fourth jhana. But it deepens. It deepens in infinite space, infinite consciousness, nothingness, and neither perception. So what's happening is you have uh, if in the in the chart that I had with the shape of the half moon, where the part, the story of equanimity was going across from the time you first went in the temple to meet the monk and sit for the first time, and imperturbability, that, that looked like it kind of, that that half moon shape, it looked like this. And over here, it said, um, you know, from calm and still and, um, and tranquility, right? That's one of the terms. And then um, the sukha, the sukha is even, the sukha was a kind of a, a, almost a, a level, a little bit more than, the tranquility because it was internal okay and then you had collectedness this is the one i was talking to him about collectedness the proper amount of collectedness and then over here was disenchantment okay and then um dispassion and then what happens is vimudi and vimudi is the liberation of the mind and then right after that, it, you know, the, the experience is like here, and then, then you have the what happens afterwards. Okay, so all these pieces here on this line, they correspond, there's not enough room to do this. Um, they correspond with, um, this is like, um, let's see if I can do it, meta, wait a minute, well, I'd say meta, Meta in these, I have to look at my chart, but it's Meta. And then you have Karuna. Sukha. And I would say Mudita is like in here, Mudita. And then you have equanimity. That's happening like about like here. And then it's going deeper and deeper and deeper. This dispassion, the moody, it's like um, this is where it hits imperturbability. So I think what you need to do is uh, if I have that chart, I can send you a picture of it or something so that you can kind of look at it. Okay. And if I if I do that. You know, you'll get you'll get an idea. I have to I have to understand there are levels of equanimity that are deepening and deepening and deepening all the way across to the point where you have nibbana happen. You know, the falling into cessation, and then you're just in the deep. Then when you come out, you come out. And I like what the person said from Florida. You know, it's like like a newborn baby's brain. And a newborn baby's brain, you know, is just full of this curiosity looking, you know, oh, oh, oh. You know, I have one grandchild when she showed up, immediately had this expression of, I am just delighted to be here. <laughs> this baby had this, this expression on her face of like, oh, I'm so glad I'm out of there and I'm here now. That's wonderful to be here, <laughs> you know, and um. And, and, and it was that way, but she was so, so um, you, you could see this child is just hyped, just really hyped and ready to be curious and look at everything as new and learn, learn, learn fast. And, you know, we can't do that. We can't, as adults, we cannot just go out when you climbed the mountain, you know, you climbed the mountain, you had a lot of information with Sarah when you went up that mountain. But how do you think it was for me when I was nine and I climbed Mount Washington the first time? Ten, no, I was 10, 10 years old. 
after climbing four other mountains, but still climbing Mount Washington. And that was really something. And I, the whole thing was like a gah, but I had all this information. And when I think about what it would be like for a baby to discover that, wow. And we so, love it. Yeah. yeah. So going back to that diagram then, um, the equanimity is a factor of awakening. Uh, that evo that evolves as that's that's uh, that starts off as calm as a fact of awakening and gradually develops through as as the practice expands. Yes, okay. and and so at the end of the line, when you say, "What is the condition necessary for a person to fall into cessation?" That's part of the condition is to get a particular level of equanimity where nothing, you know, I like David's book a lot and I like the map he had for the, um, the, the levels and the length of times for sitting and stuff, but he was talking about 20 to 30 minutes you could stay on your your um, only 20 to 30 minutes that you would stay on you're watching mine and nothing else and never minding everything and letting it go and then you would fall into cessation and i'm sorry i can't buy it because mm -hmm. when i was in korea i met a teacher who was sitting four and a half to five hours and and she was coming in saying how long did you stay on your object in meditation be before something came up that that had you move to it or or some disturbance came up even if it was we wanted to know even if it was a wiggle like a um, vibration of a um what do you call it a frequency vibration running across in front of her or a color and coming and going we wanted to know and she's and then she got to this point of four hours without anything at all okay nothing Nothing. And the guy who was in Pohang, who used to, <laughs> you know, Pohang's on a mountain and the building is there and the railing around the porch. And if you fell off the railing, you could fall down 50 feet. He didn't care. He sat on the railing, leaned against the post for seven, uh, seven and a half hours. And he didn't have anything disturbing him for mm. maybe one or they come in, they were saying like, well, one or two things came up in four and a half hours. Well, that doesn't jive. It doesn't jive. You see, or what? What he would say? It had one thing. I noticed there was something, but he he was totally his brain was. If there, your br brain inside the little guy is saying, if there is something, I'm going to let it go <laughs> from inside your head. I'm just telling you before you start for seven hours. When something does happen, I'm just going to let go. <laughs> you won't even know. And that's what was going on with him and with her. I can remember those two. There are other people. Three hours seems to be, I was telling Bunty last year uh, on the charts for six or seven retreats, I had this notion something is going on I'm missing. What is it that's going on? was that nobody was falling over until they sat three hours at least one time. Some of them sat three hours, then two, then two and a half and went over. But if I looked on the chart, they definitely, there was a definitive thing of three hour mark of sitting to three hours. I, as people say, I could never sit three hours. Of course you can, once you understand there's no such thing as time. <laughs> but you live in a world where you've been totally, totally conditioned to believe that there's time. What, what is time? This is a great lesson, you know, to do time. <laughs> you know, what is time? There's no such thing as time. You know, uh, the Native Americans, um, when I hung out with them for about three or th two years, they helped me tremendously come back and get on my feet after I had gone through this period of collapsing because they knew in their own people how um, this stuff works and what is needed is just something to do with your hands. Something to do with your hands, not to be left with nothing. 
And so they had me doing things like sticking cloth together that they were going to stitch and do beadwork on. I would just sit there all day and glue patterns together on the edge so they could do the beadwork afterwards. I was happy as a lark. I was so happy because I was doing something for someone else, which removes most of my stuff. And then there were little discussions about life and hardships and things that I would get from the medicine man. And he would drop little things like the guru would drop in your ear. And it was a fascinating time for me. You know, to, but when I look back on it, what is it that got me to move to do something? Uh, him coming and saying, you know, I got all this stuff. Can you, can you glue these together? what is this this is like something like a second grader can do for you yeah but i i just want you to sit in the hut with me while i'm sewing all day long and just glue these things together and it, when i look back on it i think wow what a simple thing and that it saved me it saved me you see so so um what was the question <laughs> i loved it <laughs> Well, you've, you've, you've covered you've covered the question. I'm so I'm, I'm walking around uh, uh, simply because I've got a couple of chickens that have got and I've just got to keep an eye on them. I kind of let my mind go. <laughs> Sometimes it leaps. <laughs> okay, but okay. Good, yeah. And I have one other one other question. Which okay. Was something you said very early in the in the session. Um, when he was talking in the Anatolaka Sutta to uh, the other monks, um, it, the, the talk uh, or the what he was saying uh, uh, removed the taints due to non clinging. And I was very interested in that because you, you're, the suggestion there is that is a, you, you're able to release, uh, release the taints of clinging, but still have the, retain, the taints of craving. Uh, of course. Present. Sure. Could you say a little, could you just say a little more about that? Well, can you recite your dependent origination, right? Oh, just yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, yep. So, so, so you're sitting there with contact as condition, feeling comes to be. Okay. Yep. With feeling as condition, craving comes to be. And with craving as condition, clinging comes to be. So mm. clinging. If to eliminate clinging, so the, the, the funny thing was we found something in the text and we realized what happened, okay? First of all, you're talking about a, a master teacher who's teaching for 45 years, okay? You're not going to find this in the Bible with Jesus making this kind of mistake because he was teaching for three years, okay? I'm just going to point that out. I'm probably not going to be able to find this. But in this case, um, when he's teaching... Uh, this this lesson, you know, and then there are other places, if anybody starts talking about clinging, immediately, what do you know about what was going on in this suit when he taught it? You know, first of all, he's got a bunch of monks in front of him, a group of monks who completely have been taught and understand dependent origination. They understand it. So if he's saying um, you, you know that they know automatically without me having to point it out like I pointed it out for you. They know automatically that if you eliminate clinging, which is mental proliferation, if you turn that off, you have not turned off craving. See, you understand? Yep. Okay, yep. so now you have the fetters. You write, you take your fetters list and go find your paper about the fetters. And you look at that list and see when it is that you get to let go of craving. What level does it happen that craving is gone? And that's arahat. Okay, so all these monks, they're not arahats. They're in a, they're in a training school. And, and in my view, they and, and the view of some people that I've talked to about this historian say, oh yeah, this was not like a, it was like a gypsy wagon moving around Europe. Okay, this was a group of people walking around India and they were transporting these, these monks are following him and every place they stop, they're continuing to work with their particular Arahat who is their teacher, who is working with them at these levels. And remember we said there were eight different kinds of people in the camp 
There were the beginners trying to be Sotapanna and the Sotapanna is trying to be fruition and the Sakadagami, Sakadagami fruition, Anagami, Anagami fruition, Arahat, Arahat fruition. There's your eight types of people in the camp. And I call it a camp that's movable. It's a movable camp wherever they go. So it's a movable meditation school and it's teaching the suttas and the meditation side by side, okay? So tell me the question again, say the question now, because this is short term. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so you described um, that he, uh, those monks uh, clinging, abandoned, clinging. abandoned clinging. Okay, abandoned clinging. So just let's, let's jump for just a second to the screen and let's get, let's get rid of what we did, okay, for a second. And let's show you how a person heals. This is what's important to understand when we're looking at how am I going to use this teaching to have somebody heal from where they're broken and they're caught in, in severe depression or even, um, you know, addiction or uh, just um, all different types of depressions this applies to, but anything that's going on, severe suffering, and you have this line and where we're going to look at we have the, um, the six sense doors, and then we have contact, and then we have feeling. And then what happens with that is conditioned craving can happen with the untrained mind. And then you have clinging. Then you have the birth of action, a reaction of reaction in the untrained mind or action if it's a trained mind. Okay, so let's just look at it that far. Now the person has a problem and the big problem starts here when it starts here because this is where the I enters. This is where Atta jumps in. This is where you invented I when you liked and wanted and had attachment to get something or you, and that's the baby nursing, definitely, okay, <laughs> okay, or you didn't like something, you didn't want it, and you had aversion to it. This is where it happens here in craving. So when I, with craving, these are the conditions running through like this. So they're running like this is how they're building, okay, and you're going, you want to take them down. Like Perel wants to help them to let go. Okay, so they're building this way. But to defeat them, the reverse recitation on dependent origination hides from you the fact of how they actually heal. In my experience, over the years, how do they heal? They don't go back here and stop and this from happening or try to stop contact stop feeling of course you don't you want to because the eightfold path you want to stay in wholesome things you don't want to expose yourself to see hear smell taste touch things that are going to be wrong stuff all that's true in the in the virtue side of things but what i'm talking about is how does the healing actually happen and this is critical to understand it happens from back here it happens here. It goes backwards. And one of my students taught me how it worked. I kept trying to figure out how am I going to help this person? And so what the person did first was he let go of the birth of reaction that was unhealthy for him. He let it go. And at that point, at that point, he then had less to deal with, didn't he? He had only the craving clinging, but he's not gonna do it again. You take the example of the angry man, the anger management, okay? And the first thing you say, no matter what happens, don't you strike out or strike back, that's this one. So you eliminate, I'm not gonna strike back anymore. I forgot one, wait a second. Oh, geez, how could I do that? This is my habitual thing. Wait a second, I have to. I have to get one more in here. I forgot. Poor little guy. Um, mm -hmm. So 
So right here, yeah, right here is the, um, the habitual tendency. Sorry, I knew I was missing one. The habitual reactions, they live here. And this is Bawa. And what they are is your library of your past reactions, unwholesome reactions. And then you have the birth of the reaction. Okay, now we got it right. Okay. And this one is optional. This is, well, I'll tell you why that's optional in a minute. But the first one he gives up. Okay, the first one he gives up is this one. He does not strike back does not write here. He gives up that he's not going to, he keeps a diary. He sees every time they, people talk about this, I do, I behave like that. So he said, I'm not going to do that anymore. But then he still feels the pressure inside of the craving, the clinging, habitual tenant reactions. And when he says, I'm not going to do it anymore. If he looks in his diary and he was writing what happened each time, he always did the same thing. There was a relationship here between his reaction and what set him off. Now, this has to do, if you're a psychologist, a psychiatrist, a, um, you know, um, an analyst or something, you're watching for what the person can't see in themselves. You're, you're pointing out, like I call them, the person that watches your shadow. You can't see your shadow. And your shadow is that when somebody said this, you always did that. And so the, the, the job of the, of the counselor is to point to, do you realize every time you heard this, you did this? You see that? And they say, oh, when I'm keeping my diary, I see every time I do the same thing. So I'm going to close the library. So that's the second thing they do is they close the library. Now they're going to have craving and clinging left. You see that? Okay. So now yep. when somebody says something, they're going to feel the pressure to build up into the tension. They're going to pay attention to what's happening. And that tension is, starts to arise. Okay. And they see that it, it turns into a mental proliferation, the mental proliferation. So they're going to stop. They're going to turn off the mental proliferation. They're going to stop the story. So now what do they have left? This is interesting, isn't it? Because now what they have left is what everybody has left, but you can reduce it a lot. They have this left. The eye is still there. They can feel the eye being born. This eye is being born. And I don't like and, and I, I don't want. But they don't go here anymore. This is gone. That's gone. That's gone. This is a big improvement. You see? But what I'm trying to show you is they heal this direction. So in the text, this is left for us to figure out. He didn't give you everything. <laughs> he explains outcomes and stuff. You have to read and find it and keep looking. Do you understand what I'm saying? You see? Yep. Okay. So they're actually healing from this direction, but you're hearing the recitation go from this direction for the craving to happen. And then you hear, and if um, ignorance is not there, well, this is true. If ignorance isn't there, you know, formations don't arise. If formations don't arise, consciousness doesn't arise. You see, that's true. Okay. But that's true in a vast length of time, see, way far away. But the actual healing, I wanted to know where is the healing? Where is the healing? What happened to me that made me change? And when the student, he showed me what happened with his anger, and that was the one we where it happened, he healed himself. And the other one healed himself from an addiction to pornography. He healed himself from that direction. When he came back and showed me, I realized how it stopped. Piece by piece by piece by piece. And he still had this, but he could control it now. It was just a pushing, oh, I can let go of that. Oh, it's, oh I can let go of that. He's not going to go be an Arahati. He, he changed his his relationship he got married he has a family he has a dog <laughs> it's a you know the job he wants and so forth yeah 
Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I don't know what this is. Yeah, I think that's that's all my questions. I'm sorry, my camera's not working for some reason, rather, so I'm just blank. But, uh, something, I'm, I'm, something. With, I'm with you with that. <laughs> okay, something, something happened here, too. I don't know what it is. Maybe I can turn it off. Okay, there we go. Okay. So the point is that if you look at how your patient, how the consumer is having the problem, okay, what is the X? You know what builds up to the X, whatever it is, okay? Can they see what the X is? Is it a burst of anger? It is, a, is it a breakdown and falling desperately fast into depression? What is it? So when they see in a diary, they have to do it. You can't tell them, they have to tell you. Yep. That's the secret behind this whole thing is the Buddha knew this. He knew that you couldn't tell them. They have to tell you. That's the same thing with teaching somebody about the past and the future and the present. You can talk until you're blue in the face. I give you that lesson, but I always try to remind you um, try to show you how I'm showing the person by playing the little girl and asking you what is true about the past. Tell me, they have to do that. This is the ultimate Chinese lesson in learning. The, on the elementary school in the Republic of China had the sign on the door. When we come in this room, we hear the teacher, we see them write it. And we write it and we say it and then we know it. And then they have to do it. And there's this little list on the door. That's how they teach. That's why the, they're such uh, good students and they get such high grades. These they had the system from the time they were in first grade. Watch, listen to the teacher. Watch me show you. You do it. You say it with me. Now you know it now do it you see and the buddha is doing the same thing so anybody else yeah okay anybody hmm? anybody have any more questions we'll take one more <laughs> that's it we, we went an extra hour we had a nice hour didn't we or we had an hour, we had an hour, I think, close to an hour and 15 minutes, I think. And then we <laughs> and then we went off the deep end. This is fun though. This is what I love, you know. Now I have to tell you something interesting. You're gonna have fun. You probably hear about what's happening. I don't know how I'm gonna get these recorded. I'm working on that now. I've accepted a, a accepted a um, retreat to do in Pune um, for, I think it's, tell me what the dates are, Bonte. <laughs> tell yeah, me what yeah. it is. Uh, but we have no fixed dates. Uh, you have to kind of uh, negotiate the dates in September. No, I have the dates. You have the dates? Yeah, I do, for the, for the nuns I'm talking about. And this is yeah, actually, you're gonna really find this interesting in the end because it's a Catholic convent and because these are 13 nuns who are professors and teachers and I'm gonna really, really enjoy doing this because I love to do this um, with uh, Christian audiences. I love to be able to take them uh, into the commonalities instead of the differences with uh, what was being taught by the Buddha and, and look at that in a strong way because that's what really, is the most important part of every religion in the world is loving kindness, compassion, joy, equanimity, and, and the use of forgiveness and that development that happens from that. So basically what's being looked at right now, I think, um, and this is a... Um, Have you discussed with them? I don't think you've discussed with them. Hmm? Have you discussed with the other party, the nuns? Oh yeah, Rohi did. Rohi called. Yeah, okay. And this happened because why? Because um, because one of our board members gave a um, recording to um, the uh, abbess at the convent to listen to, and it, it had to do with, it's a really good one. You probably have heard the talk, Naturopathy College in Portland. That's a really nice recording 
of Bonte giving a talk and they, they figured out um, what we're teaching. And then, you know, um, early, early this morning, I was listening to, um, and y'all should do this is very interesting, but listen to Father Keating, K-E-A-T-I-N-G, who te he, he teaches what's called Christian Centering Prayer. And the Christian Centering Prayer is a method of going to what the ultimate uh, ultimate reality inside ourselves to discover the truth of how the nature of the human being actually is. And he teaches in prisons and other places. We knew about him years ago when Bonte and I, we, we were teaching in, in the prisons in um, Florida. And so uh, they're familiar, I think, probably with him, you see, and he is teaching something that stems uh, is very similar to the descriptions that were left of St. Francis of Assisi. And, and most people know a picture of St. Francis of Assisi as a Christian monk with all the little animals. Um, he's sitting in the field and all the little animals are sitting around him and crawling all over him. And, and his energy is completely in loving kindness and, um, uh, and um, compassion. And they feel this. And uh, so this is gonna be fun and it's gonna happen in, um, it's September, I know it's September, but it ends I think on the 22nd or something like that. Mm -hmm. In September. 12 to 22 you said, or ending on 21st. 22nd, 22nd. So you want to, uh, bit, uh, okay. It's 10 days, it's a genuine 10 days because I come, I, I go up there one day before and stay at the center there. And then, so that's what's happening for um, the longer period. And then next week, there'll be monks and the head teachers for Polly from some places. There'll be six of us here at the house sequestering in a retreat with a uh, probably a, where they're trained the advice given to me was train them twice a day. So there'll be a morning and evening training period. And uh, the morning periods will be like questions and a short piece of training. And then the evening one will be a Dhamma talks. So that's what's happening here right now. And then, you know, we'll branch out from here after that. Many good things are happening. So I hope you all stay tuned. Um, and there should be a retreat center that we start to use, uh, I imagine in October is what I'm thinking. That probably will, is that right, October? October 20th, around 20th, uh, I think uh, is the end of the Vasa. So if you want, uh, you can go for a seven day retreat uh, or, or a 10 day retreat, whatever you plan. You can make uh, one more retreat. If you're anyways going for the 10 day retreat in uh, Pune, you can uh, uh, do a one more retreat in uh, this thing also. The new center we are planning. Oh, over in the center, yeah. So we're. I'm looking. I'm looking at some things. So. Really interesting. Okay, so very happy to all of you. Let's say a prayer and close this session. Stay tuned with us and get news. May suffering ones be suffering free, and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief, and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, Deva and Magasya, my dear share, this, share merit. this merit of ours. May they long May protect the Buddha's the dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.